Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 147. X marks the spot, digital mapping tools for tabletop games. I'm Sean, and with me as always, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. And we never mentioned your last name. My last name gets brought up. We're just like, no, no one can know who Sean is. Maybe Sean's just like a, a collective. That uh, has to do with the collecting Sean's. All right, I am Mo Tuzno, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Tonight, also the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash Tabletop Bellhop. All right, tonight we've got someone looking for preferably free digital mapping tools for their RPG games. And we found a number of great suggestions out there. After that, I've got a review of the FSXIA box insert for Zaya Legends of a Drift System. That's coming from Folded Space. And we wrap up with our usual week in review, where I've got thoughts on Space Base, Emergence of Shy Pluto, spoiler free, how Villainous plays with six players, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, and first thoughts on Viscounts of the West Kingdom. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of interactions with you fine folk. While we may not read your comment off during the show, know that we appreciate all of your feedback tremendously. Our first comment this week was on our topic of great epic fantasy games that you can play solo. Jay Barons writes, no contest, Tainted Grail. Ah, the Gloomhaven killer. Now that it seems that people have gotten Tainted Grail, the, the Kickstarter is delivered, it's in people's hands and people are playing it. I gotta say, I haven't heard much about it. I will say for sure it didn't kill Gloomhaven, at least on Board Game Geek, at least. It's still, Gloomhaven's still up there at number one, and I don't even see Tainted Grail in the top ten the last time I looked. At least top five. Now, this was a game I wasn't sure. I, I looked at the Kickstarter app integration. I don't know. I'm always leery about app integration, especially a huge game that's going to take me possibly over a year to beat. I always worry they're going to kill the app before I finish the game. So I wasn't sure on this one, so I wanted to wait for reviews before considering picking it up and i still like i said i haven't heard much so i have no idea um there's obviously fans like jay jay wouldn't have written in if he wasn't a fan of the game but i was expecting a lot more hype once this hit the market maybe it's still coming in in retail i'm not even sure you heard anything about this something you follow twitter a little more than i do uh, again i kind of forgot this game existed yeah um it's got a solid rating with a solid number of ratings on board game geek so i mean it's it's doing the rating thing on for the the you know the 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 hobbyists but right. uh it doesn't seem to have really made any kind of inroads into the the greater gestalt i guess what is it ranked right now um you know what i didn't check the rank it's a solid uh, eight. it's an all solid eight three though eight three I mean, is pretty oh, good yeah, absolutely but it's not gloomhaven good nope at least on there so yeah if, if anyone locals got it i'd love to check it out try it out at some point all right, well, next we have Daryl P., who commented on our Terraforming Mars FAQ video to say, thanks for this video. My wife and I have played well over 100 games wow. of Terraforming Mars and realized there were a few rules we weren't playing quite correctly. We own the Prelude, Hellas and Elysium, and Colonies expansions. We actually dislike the Colonies expansion and simply kept the cards from it in our main deck, the ones that do not require the actual expansion rules to play. Question for you, though. Do you know where I could purchase all the promo cards for Terraforming Mars in one spot, or is this next to impossible? Oh, thanks for the comment, Daryl. Um, I'm glad to say this video seems to have started getting more views. All hail the YouTube algorithm. As for your question, the best place I know of to get promos like this is the Board Game Geek Geek Shop. And I don't know, this is a part of Board Game Geek people may not even realize is there. They carry a number of promos for a number of games including no small amount of terraforming mars ones what i don't know is if they have all of them i actually don't know um kind of in a way that's where i got the ones i do own i have three terraforming mars promos and they're all from board game geek though i actually got them from the board game geek booth at origins instead of actually buying them online the bgg store is great um which leads me to my next suggestion though like i got mine at origins which would be go to a game con um especially any of the big ones where board game geeks there 
for one, so you can try to get the promos right off them without having to worry about shipping, which is the main reason I did it, or possibly just go to like to the Stronghold Games booth or whoever publishes Terraforming Mars, wherever you are. If you're in North America, that's Stronghold Games, but like Frick's Games may have a booth if you're not in North America. Other than that, you might be stuck with places like eBay. Though one thing you can do, another aspect of Board Game Geek that a lot of people miss is the marketplace. This is where people sell and trade games personally between users. Now, on Board Game Geek, every single Terraforming Mars promo is listed, and it's like they're separate games. Well, every game listing will list if someone has a game for sale or for trade. So you might be able to get them all through BGG, but you're probably going to have to buy them off different users. All right, well, next up, a comment from Will McDonald who confirms we're, uh, we're not wrong in regards to Tapestry by writing, exactly, it is a Civ game. Maybe it's not done the way Civ games have been done in the past, but it is a Civ game. A Civ game for the rest of us. Thank you for this honest review. Well, thank you, Will. Um, I'm somewhat shocked we didn't get more comments on this one. I actually expected some of that negative feedback, some of those thumbs downs on our comments, our tapestry review. Um, I, I expected to hear from people on both sides of the Civ game fence, but it's good to hear from someone that we aren't the only ones that felt like it was a fine Civ game, just doing it different from anyone else. Well, next, a comment from one of our patron patrons, Brian Sheen, who commented on our The Red Bernus Algeria 1857 content to say, another historical game, awesome. I will probably try to run a full miniature game based on this as an inspiration. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, I can totally see the whole setting of the French colonization of Algeria being an awesome setting for many war games. I didn't look into it. I bet you there are others out there besides the Red Bernus. But what I want to see is the terrain. I want to see someone do a miniature game of this particular setting, these particular villages, because these are in the mountains of Algeria with only three paths into the region. And the treacherous paths are actually one of the main things that let the Algerians stand their ground as long as they did. Now, before we do get to the next question, since we're talking about the Red Bernus, I want to remind everyone that it is live on Kickstarter right now. Uh, today is the second day, and it's so close to funding. I don't know if it's actually hit there yet. I haven't been back today. I strongly support this Kickstarter for highlighting a war from the victim side, for doing something cool and new for deck building, and for being a very solid game. Now, what I'll do is I'll be sure to drop a link in the show notes because it is up for 28 days, or I think it was 30 days total. So you'll be able to hear this. If you're listening on Tuesday, you'll be able to catch it in the show notes. And Sean, if you could drop a link in the chat, I would appreciate it. All right. Well, finally, let's leave off with another comment from one of our great Patreon patrons, Roger Malosh, who commented on our great games for a one-hour grade school gaming event with Hellstones. King's Gambit is a quick push-your-luck memory mm -hmm. game. Beastie Bar is simple and fun and might go well with the young, younger players. See that. Band and All Artichokes is a great little deck de deconstruction game. It's easy and very fast. Nice. Of course, Sushi Go is always great for large groups. And I almost forgot, Fit is a blast to play with up to seven players and is dead easy. Bring earplugs if you plan on play playing Pit. Great suggestions there, Roger. Uh, we'll be sure to toss links to all those in the show notes. I don't know if Roger knew we were going to read off his comment tonight because he showed up in the chat, so that was kind of fortuitous. I, the only one I question there is Pit, just because I know it's a stock market game. And stock markets in grade school seems like an odd mix. But if it's that simple to play, I know it's actually more set collection. I can totally see it. Um, Tellstones is an interesting one. That is the latest game from uh, Riot Games, the people who do Mechs versus Minions and um, League of Legends, right? Like it's a big video game publisher. Their second game after one of the most best produced board games ever made was this weird stone-based memory game that just like a row of 10 things. And, and I got to say, reviews were not overly positive for it. So it's good to see someone recommend the game. Personally, I was on the fence about this one, especially like I, I can't help but compare it to their other game. And one's just so big and awesome. And I'm like, memory? Like, like you, I got to remember the order the stones are in. That's all I'm doing. Seemed a little strange. But obviously, Roger's got a copy. So again, once things open up, because I'm pretty sure they're about to lock all down again, maybe we'll get together and you can show me how to play. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. 
Tonight's, tonight's question comes from longtime fan of the show, Nate Parker, who wrote, question for the bellhop. Do you know of any RPG map making websites or tools, ideally free, that mm. can allow the user to create and or generate both city and country maps? Primarily needs to be maps the user can create. Well, thanks for the question, Nate. Uh, first off, I have to start by saying, what a world we live in now that this is a thing. Like, let me put on my grognard net beard and say, back in my day, if you wanted a map, you had to go out and buy a module or sit down with graph paper and draw it yourself. Well, to be fair, while a few DMs were masterful, masterful artists, and many somehow always ended up drawing something vaguely phallic, <laughs> it got the point across, and we, as players, understood enough to describe our positions or place minis or figure out which way to turn in the dungeon. I let me take the props off and say, and it sucked. Sure, when I first got into fantasy gaming, I had fun drawing maps. Everyone did, right? Especially I was in grade school and high school, right? Doodling. I used up my fair share of graph paper. Even trying the whole isometric thing, right? You got the funky diagonal, the, the diamond graph paper to try to do 3D stuff. And then even the, I even tried those weird triangle shaped maps for making worlds that like made D20s or something if you put them together. And it was always fun at first. But then I found they got boring quickly. Plus, I was spending more time making maps and dungeons than I was playing in them. I, and then there's the very common occurrence where maps, entire maps, or at least large portions of them, wouldn't even get used. There's nothing like prepping an entire portion of an adventure that doesn't get used. Mm -hmm. It's something that every DM runs into. It's one thing if you've prepped some stat blocks and ideas for a part of a dungeon, it's a whole other thing if you've yeah. spent hours carefully rendering it in fine detail. Especially if you like to draw in all the rooms and the barrels and the planks and scenery as well. Now, I know there are people out there that still love hand-drawing maps. One of my favorite people on the planet, fellow Canadian Dice and Logos, draws awesome hand-drawn maps for a living. I actually watch him live stream three times a week because he also puts on awesome industrial music. So I have him on while I'm working throughout the day now. And I give full props to anyone who actually enjoys the mapping hobby. All the power to you and thank you for putting out maps for those of us without the skill or patience to make our own. And there are way less unintentional fallacies this way. Remind me in the after show that comment and Dyson logos for a reason. <laughs> Now, there was a point back in the early 90s, uh, specifically 1992, when TSR released the AD&D 2nd Edition Core Rules CD. That had copies of all the two-week core books, though not like PDFs. You couldn't flip through them. Just all the rules were there using some kind of 1990s, early 90s um, SQL software or something. Paper card. Where, yeah, it's something. I don't know what it used, but like you couldn't read the book from cover to cover, but like you could look up the rules for things. And it had rules for making characters and encounters. No, no, it wasn't new in 4E. I heard way too many people complaining about 4E using digital tools, and I've been using them since second edition. Now, with that package also came a copy of Pro Fantasy Software, which had three different separate programs, Campaign Cartographer, City Designer, and Dungeon Designer. These were for drawing maps. This is actually the first piece of software that I know of that brought mapping to the masses. Now, the problem was this is literally CAD software. It was vector graphics. It was not easy to use. The, the learning curve was steep to insurmountable. Most people like me gave up on it. So again, some people did embrace it and actually went on to start publishing maps and professionally using it. And many of the RPG publishers at the time were using this software. Yeah, now CAD software for maps or anything else is absolutely a skill. And mm -hmm. often one doesn't want to have to learn just to play a game. Now, thankfully, things have continued to advance from there. Today, we have a rather large number of mapping software options, and lucky for Nate, many of them are free, or at least offer free versions with the option to pay more for upgrades or premium versions or downloadable art packs or whatever. I've got to say, these tools are quite amazing, most of which allow you to make maps we would have only dreamed of back in the day. Like back when I was running maps, like even the best looking module maps 
like garbage compared to what you can make in seconds with some of the software. Maps compete, created with these free tools actually rival some of the best professional work out there to some artist's chagrin. And this list won't even take into consideration your basic graphics programs mm -hmm. or things like Photoshop that you might already have, which with often free brushes and templates, yep. you can generate Tolkien-esque maps Maybe not with ease, but far easier than drawing all those trees and mountain ranges yes. in by hand. And to be honest, I don't have it on the list tonight, but there is specifically a site for mapping with GIMP and telling you how to do it your own. Now, I didn't include that on the list because to me, that was like, you got to learn GIMP and then you got to do that. So now before we do get on to our list of tools, I do want to point out that Nate's question and then most of these tools are designed for role players. They're, they're, they're made for role playing game use. But there's no reason you couldn't find uses for these for board games. These could be great for prototyping. If you are a game designer and you need a board for your new coin like game featuring birds, this would be a great way to design that board. Or a map to be used during your game. War games, like you can do hexes everywhere. Hex maps. You could even use something like campaign cartographer or hexographer to make Gloomhaven scenarios. That's not out of the question. So, well, primarily designed for RPGs, I can see people finding use in these that aren't role players. And now on to our list of map making tool suggestions. Now, one thing I did do is I took some liberty with Nate's question because I think people out there are going to care about it. What I did include on this list are random generators. Now, Nate specifically asked he wanted user-created maps and user control, but I also included some random generators, and I will call that out when it happens, just because I think that's going to be more used to people other than just Nate. Though most of the random generators are actually done well enough that you can combine them and kind of tweak them so there is some user input. Now, the first piece of software I want to mention tonight is the one I already mentioned, Pro Fantasy Software's suite of mapping tools. That was around in the 1990s and is still around now. Now, the most popular is Campaign Cartographer, which is on Campaign Cartographer version 3, and it's come a long way from its origins. They also have new versions of City Designer and Dungeon Designer, also somehow on version 3, but they've added to this a ton of new tools, like Character Artist, Cosmographer, or Cosmo Cosmographer? Cosmographer. Cosmographer, that's, the word. that's how I was trying to pronounce it. Fantasy Floor Plans. A piece of software just called Modern, Fractal Terrains, and more. Now, of all the tools, they've spent the most time on Campaign Cartographer. They know that this is their flagship. And this is the most recommended software for designing overland maps for games. It's the one that gets recommended the most. And the one I see the most credits going to in published modules. Now, the big problem here is two things. There's the fact that it's CAD, right? It's We kind of mentioned that, but also it costs money. It always has, and I expect it always will. Now, since COVID started, they have put all of it on sale for half price. Basically, you know, since you're stuck at home, and until uh, further notice, everything is half off. But buying the entire suite of software costs $620 US. That's with the half off sale. And then each additional piece of software costs separately. If you don't buy this bulk, you buy campaign cartographer, it costs this much. You want dungeons, you got to buy another thing. You want taverns, you need another thing. And then there's add-ons for all of these, including annual add-ons they put out with new assets and everything. And yes, you get it all with the $620, but like Nate's looking for cheap. So even if you just want campaign cartographer, if you want to do a frozen tundra, you might need some kind of add-on. Note that I didn't confirm that. So pro fantasy is not cheap. But it is a tried and true, fully developed suite of tools that is actually used by the gaming industry. This is the software used to create many of the maps and the books you know and love. Now, one nice thing I will say about Dungeon Designer and the Pro Fantasy software is that while, yes, $620 for a suite of software is expensive mm -hmm. compared to what is happening with many pieces of software now with a subscription model, uh -huh. over time, this purchase model is definitely going to save you money. Yep. Uh, so if you are looking and willing to put a down, put out an investment up front, which is, again, it's a steep investment. Mm -hmm. There's no question there. Uh, 
you're not paying recurring fees over and over again for life like you would be by buying Photoshop. Yep. And that was the Pro Fantasy series of mapping tools. All right, my next suggestion is probably my strongest suggestion of the night. I probably should have put this at the end of the list because it's going to be anticlimactic after this in a way. And that is incarnate. It's spelled ink, I-N-K-A-R-N-A-T-E, incarnate. This is, to me, the opposite end of the pro fantasy software as far as user experience is concerned. It is so much simpler to ease and use, like just to, to learn it. Drawing with incarnate, isn't like learning CAD. It's more like using a paint program. It's more like using Photoshop. Now it comes with a ton of built-in icons and brushes and stamps, and you literally just point and click to draw them on your maps. Now, Incarnate is perfect for what Nate's looking for. It's designed to create all the map types you should need. You can do world maps, region maps, city maps, village maps, battle maps with grids or hexes, and interior maps. Now, this is the tool that most modern mappers use. If you go through drive through RPG and start looking at the 5e supplemental material you can buy, almost everyone's using Incarnate now. Now, there is a free version of Incarnate that you play around with. It is limited, and you'll be tempted to upgrade if you do check this out. What's really impressive, and I have no idea if Nate's looking for this, the fact he's looking for free is probably not, but I thought it's worth mentioning, is they do also offer a commercial license. So if you plan on creating your maps to sell them, either as maps standalone or use them in modules or something else, this is a great option for people that want to sell maps and adventures and third-party products. Now, the one other bonus of Incarnate is that it is 100% online. It is an online tool, so there's no software to download. This means you can use it on various devices. So you can download it on Apple, you can download it on, on uh, your Android, you can download it in Windows, and everything's saved in the cloud. So you can then use multiple different devices to access it, which is really cool. Now, of course, the downfall being this is in the cloud and the same problem we've talked about with app-based games. If Incarnate ever goes out of business or decides to shut things down, you might be in trouble. Now, I think Incarnate is at this point looking pretty stable. Yes. Uh, now, they are a subscription-based because they are online. It is subscription-based. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say for what you get, the fees are incredibly reasonable. $25 a year or $5 a yes. month. That's like nothing. Uh, and the like... difference and the difference between the free and the paid is significant. So with the free, yeah. you get 700 uh, different things to use and, and play with, uh, which will get you a, a great little, you know, experiment. Uh, and you can export at 2000 pixels uh, mm -hmm. for personal use only. Uh, for up to 10 maps. Now, as soon as you go to $25 a year, you get not 700, but 14,000 assets mm -hmm. with 8K resolution images. And the moment you pay them a dime, anything you've created under a pro account is resellable. So as yep. soon, you, it's not a separate commercial license. If you are paying the money, Okay. Anything you generate can be sold. And so that's that's pretty impressive. And I got to say, the maps look good. Like, like they, they don't look old school. They look new, modern, colorful, lighting, all kinds of special effects. I, it, it's impressive software. Yeah, the, the interior uh, lighting effects that are, that are generated yeah. look really impressive. So uh, that is Incarnate or Incarnate. Yeah, Incarnate. Next, I've got something that takes even less work, and that are the is the the, the various map making tools at Don John. I swear we mentioned Don John before in a previous episode. I might have been a Sunday brunch, but if you're an RPG gamer and you haven't been to Don John, that's D O N J O N, which is why I'm saying it weird. It's not Dungeon; it's Don John. You have to go bookmark that site right now. It's donjon.bin.sh. I don't know why it's got the weird URL, but that's what it is. Go bookmark that right now. Very, very site, Unix URL. Yeah, <laughs> it, uh, yeah, and we'll we'll drop a link in the show notes too, so for people can get it. I just tossed a link into our chat room for the awesome people who've joined us here live. So you got to you got to bookmark the site. This is a site filled to the brim with free RPG tools of all kinds for all kinds of different systems and settings, fantasy to sci-fi. Now, one of the coolest features on Don John is its random map maker. There's a random world generator, random town generator, treasure map generator, and of course, a random dungeon generator. 
while it doesn't make the prettiest of maps, they're very functional and you can change all kinds of settings to get a map that should be perfect for your game or what you need at the time. This site is all about functionality and not looks. So it's perfect for a home game or for inspiration, but I wouldn't suggest using this if you were someone looking to publish your work. And I actually have a feeling you probably can't use their stuff for free. I didn't dig into that. Personally, I think this is a great site to use during prep to come up with ideas and brainstorming, give you ideas, or to come up with something on a fly when your players go off the expected path and they decide to investigate a cave that you just came up with off the top of your head. You can go here and quickly randomly generate a cave system or you can quickly generate the town they're visiting or you know there's a combat on a ship that didn't go well and they need repairs and they pull into the closest port here's a great way to generate that port on the fly yeah interestingly don john does in C, uh use I, uh, the ogl for some content but i think uh because of the the various tools involved mm. you would need to be careful depending on what you're using uh the one thing i do notice is while they have a ton of fantasy options uh and they have one sign or one set of science fiction options they don't actually have anything modern interesting. um which is interesting uh, i guess people just generally use modern maps and i, I was gonna for, say do you really need a mapping tool for most modern games you know what personally i don't like using existing cities i like creating right. my own city um so I, I would i would like a uh, a modern city uh, map maker but uh again if you're looking for fantasy or again science, science fiction uh and also with different rule sets so whether you're looking yep. at generic fantasy ad and d 2e d20 micro light pathfinder 4e 5e they're all there specifically to that rule set when they're generating things yep so that's a big benefit and that is donjon.bin.sh now my next piece Whoop, I jumped one, sorry. That leads me to Dungeon Scrawl. This is the software that makes Dice and Logos crack. The reason for this is this is a click and draw software where basically you get a grid, you click your mouse and start drawing rooms. Like it's that simple. It makes it look like it's drawn by hand, like professional cartographers. It has the hand-drawn look and the hand-drawn hatching. And honestly, since this has come out, I know Dyson has gotten attacked regularly online by people claiming he just uses Dungeon Scroll. The thing is, it's that good. It is that easy to make great looking maps with Dungeon Scroll. Now it features a variety of brushes. You even get layers. It lets you import assets to add features to your dungeon. So you can even do your own monster icons and dungeon dressing. Now one limited one, one problem with the software, if you can call it that, is it really is called Dungeon Scrawl for a reason. Yes, there is a way to do indoor maps in cities. They're so-so. Uh, it's really designed for dungeons. And there is no way to do overland or regional maps, which is something Nate was looking for. But like this site is way too much fun just to play with. I, I wasted way too much time when doing research for this episode, just clicking around and editing hexagonal rooms and trying out the different filters and stuff on Dungeon Scrawl. You want dead simple. I, there's nothing even to learn. Just go play with it and you'll figure it out in seconds. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a, a fantastic tool for that classic dungeon look. Yeah. Um, there, there are some, uh, there are some licensing things you need to take account. I'm not going to go into those, but yeah. uh, they, they do have a licensing session uh, section. So do read through depending on how you want to use things. But uh, absolutely, Dungeons Crawl or DungeonScrawl.com is a fantastic resource for all your dungeoning needs. And just to clarify, every single one of these, you're free to use for home use. If you're just playing your own game with your own group, there's no licensing to worry about. We're just mentioning it for people because we do know there's content creators out there that sell maps and dungeons and PDFs of our Well, and also stuff. you do ne possibly need to be careful if you are putting things out on, on World Anvil yes. uh, for public consumption, even if it, you're not officially publishing it. If you're mm -hmm. putting it out there for public consumption, you may run into issues. But again, yes, in your home game, yes. this is fine. The other thing, too, is if you are streaming or using a virtual tabletop online, licensing is a thing. Yep. You are not necessarily free to grab any map you want to use in your live stream, which is the other reason we mentioned it. All right, next piece of map making software is not for me at all, but I can see some people digging it. This is uh, the, the site is called Deep Night Games, 
And their piece of software is really simple. It's just called RPG Map Editor 2. This free software is for designing JRPG-style top-down maps. Uh, one of the things these people are obviously proud of with this software is adding lighting to your maps because all of the sample maps are very glowing. There's lots of different colored lights. And while the maps look nice and colorful, they just have that angular wall thing because they have the JRPG, right? So you either have a straight corner or you have a diagonal corner and that's it. And that said, they look great for the style they're going for. Like if they look good, if that's the look you want, all the power to you. One of the things that is an advantage to this is everything you make in this is free to use even for commercial use. And then someone else pointed out to me that this integrates with some of the virtual tabletops directly and some of the random map generators we're gonna mention later can be tied into this so that they can create a better looking map from one of the not so pretty dungeon generators. So the integration with other software is actually up there on this one. Yeah, and this one is, it's on its uh, second major version uh, with 16 updates to this version. It is capable of running HTML5 in the browser, or they do have a Windows download available from their website or from Itch.io. So fantastic, again, again, it's very stylized, uh, but if that's the look you're going for, it's pretty tough to beat. And while well, the price is pay what you want, including free. That was, uh, sorry, the Deep Map Editor, or the RPG Map Editor 2 from deepnight.net. Next, I got one I don't have a lot of information on. It's called the RPG Battle Map Maker. This is at mapper-rpg.com. Now, this is pretty basic, but functional top-down map maker meant to be for battle maps with a grid on them. This is, you're going to put put it on a virtual tabletop, put it on your, you know, screen that you now have set into your gaming table for putting miniatures on or print out um, your big battle maps. It features um, layers and various art assets that you literally just drag and drop, right? You click on the bushes, you put the bushes out, you click around. Now, the art is functional, but not great looking. It, it's at, at the maps they even show just seem repetitive to me. Like they show a jungle scene with a wreck boat in, and they've got a video you can watch to see how the, how to use it. And they're just not enough tree types. Now the impressive part though, is you can import your own graphics. So it seems like if you wanted to spend the time to import a bunch of your own graphics, it's a real simple tool. And I learned, and I didn't realize this when I wrote the notes, but as I got deeper into my research, they call these tile mappers where you're basically selecting tiles of different art assets and putting on the map. So this is a tile map maker for making overland, like over the top down battle maps. The best part here, of course, 100% free. Uh, so it, it's 100% three for three maps. Uh, uh, they do have a premium user uh, after seven days uh, of, of free use at premium. You then get uh, $4.99 $4 per month. Mm. Um, to me, it's it's interesting. I'm the style feels very dated to me. Yeah. Um there is a advanced version of Microsoft Paint feel to it. Um and it's not I mean we're not talking the basic Microsoft Paint. Yeah, meme, the graphics meme maker. are better. It's but... not meme it's not meme maker paint level, but again, it's it's basic uh very very basic and again repetitive because it is a tile based system. Yeah. Uh useful but uh, definitely not something you're probably going to be publishing anything on. But again, no. that's not necessarily what you're looking for. Yep. Uh, but again, it is only three maps for free. So All right. I totally missed that. I just saw that there was a free version. So yeah, three maps isn't a lot, though I'm pretty sure you could go in incognito mode and do three more maps. And, then... and that is mapper.rpg.com, one P in mapper, not two. Oh, interesting. All right, that leads me to another mapper with the proper number of Ps. We've got Dave's Mapper, Dave's M-A-P-P-E-R. There's another random map generator that's inspired by hand-drawn maps. This one's weird. Like, I, Sean's bringing it up. He's probably going to, like, start when he sees it because it's so weird. What's really impressive here is the number of different styles that are featured from actual RPG mappers, actual hand-drawn maps from actual people who have given Dave permission to use them. Once you pick a type of map, so you got dungeon, cavern, village, side view, dungeon, etc. There's a ton of options. It generates a map from geomorphs created by some of the best known mappers in the world. Yes, Dyson Logos is here. You actually get Dyson's maps. 
Well, I got to say, it's very interesting to see a map made up of all kinds of different styles. You're probably going to want to limit it to just one mapper or a small selection of mappers if you're trying to do something that looks good. But if all you want is a functional random map, Dave's Mapper got you covered. 100% free, ability to export the maps. This is a great way to get a quick map. And I got to say, it's just fun to browse through all the different artist styles on this site. Yeah, no, there's there's some really fantastic stuff here. Uh, it'll you'll you'll play for a while before you ever generate anything you're actually going to want. But <laughs> once you've played for a while and 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 figured some things out, I think it's something you can really enjoy. And the fact that you are literally using something from professional mappers yep. uh, is a great uh, a great tool. And that is Dave'sMapper.com. Next, we get to the Tiamat tile mapper so this is this is where i learned that you call these tile mappers and when i googled tile mapper i saw that's what you call this um this works like all the other like click on a thing and then click on the map to place it at the bottom of the screen are a bunch of pre-made rooms and corridors you click on those click them where you want to go attach them how you want this is made by skeleton key games who actually produces and sells dungeon maps and drive through rpg so what they've done is taken sections of their own maps for the tiles. Now, the biggest problem I had with this site is probably one not everyone's going to have, but the image, the, the tiles are, are saved as images, JPEG specifically. And I have a Pinterest plugin that every time it sees an image wants me to save it to Pinterest. And I was having a bear of a time trying to click on these, trying to save them to print to Pinterest. And yes, I know it's me. And yes, I know I can turn the plugin off. I actually had to even be able to use this site. Um, this one's simple. This is this is very easy to use and very basic with very basic squarish round rooms and pretty simple corridors and your usual crosses. And there are no furnishings or decor for the dungeons you, you make, just corridors and rooms. Now it does have the ability that if you get like the premium version, you can start uploading your own graphics. And I'm assuming you can probably get to a bigger database. I probably wouldn't recommend this one strongly, but if you do just really quickly, I could see like being in a virtual tabletop and someone opening a door you didn't expect, like a, a whatever, they teleported 30 feet to the left and you're like, oh, what's over there? And you just need to throw around a, a quick something to show on your VT, your, um, what, a D20 or whatever you want to show on your virtual tabletop. I could see using it for that. I can't see using this to design all your maps. So the main reason I can see people not using this is because of their microtransaction system. So while it is always free to create all of your maps, to get a map out once you have created it costs huh. money. So you pay for exporting your maps, uh, either $2 for a single map, or you can buy bundles. So you can export three maps for $4 or so on and so forth. Huh. And it's all microtransaction driven. Um, I'm questionable about this. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with the art. Again, it's, it's a tile-based system. You know what you're getting. Uh, they've got a, a specific style that they go for, which mm -hmm. is very, you know, OSR sort of, -y sort of feeling. But uh, if you don't like microtransactions, this is definitely not the site for you. Otherwise, if you are interested, this is at rpgobjects.com slash Tiamat. Next up, I have Dungeon Painter. This free-to-use map-making software makes maps that look like they're created in Pro Fantasy software. Like, it really does. Like, I almost wonder if they just, like, somehow imported the assets. Uh, this is another basic drag-and-drop, right? Click on the thing, click on the map to have it show up. Um, it does have virtual tabletop integration. So this gets recommended a lot. Every forum I saw where people are like, what map making software do you use to run your games on Roll20? Or like, check out Dungeon Painter. What do you use to run your games on Tabletop Simulator? Check out Dungeon Painter. So this one looks interesting. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting is you could buy it on Steam. This is the first one that like, this isn't web-based. You have to buy it and download it. Um, this looks to be a full service mapping suite that offers all the basics. While not being CAD-based like the actual Pro Fantasy software. So this one is a little interesting. Uh, the reason it's not online anymore is because yeah. it is a Flash-based software. Mm -hmm. So the Steam, the standalone Steam app is a standalone, uh, you know, compiled version of, 
of the Flash app and whatever the, whatever they're compiling Flash in these days from Adobe. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, however, a beta of Dungeon Painter Studio 2 out now. Uh, I would personally, based on what I'm seeing from the website, hold off and not purchase Dungeon Painter Studio and wait for Dungeon Painter Studio 2 to become available since they will have finally thrown away their their flash roots and yep. the uh the problems that come with flash in the modern age uh that being said uh they are going to be uh generating a lot of different things for multiple top uh, popular virtual tabletops mm -hmm. in the new system so you won't just be limited to tabletop simulator but you will be able to uh involve work with other virtual tabletops as well so what I could not find anywhere is this was on multiple free lists. I could not find a free version. And I'm wondering if that's just the old Adobe version, the Flash version was free. Yeah, so originally no with the online version, what, when, when Flash wasn't banned, uh, it was free online. Ah, but that so has since uh, gone away. And I guess people just haven't upload, updated, haven't updated their, their lists the since yeah. Flash disappeared. So uh, I probably shouldn't even have this one on the list, but I couldn't confirm that myself. So currently you can uh, get it on Steam, that is Dungeon Painter Studio, or you can go to pyromancers.com and check out the Dungeon Painter Studio 2 beta. All right, speaking of basic, easy to use ones, this is a really simple one called GM Friend. This is the most basic software I found while researching this topic. It lets you do hex maps and dungeon maps with only the most basic of icons. Super simple to use. There's a hex map. It automatically gen generates one. There's different graphics you could throw in and click and put them in. Now, I wouldn't recommend this as something to use before your game. Like, I wouldn't use this to map out my whole dungeon and all my cities. But if you need a really quick overland for your Roll20 game or you're running something online or even at a table and you're like, oh, I need a quick hex map to show this because, again, someone cast a teleport spell or you, they, they decided to put a um, bunt bag of holding inside Lehman's tiny hut and things went poof. And you want to send them to Bagland use something like this. Like it's just uh, the, the simplicity of this one is almost striking that it's like, you're going to make a map in seconds. Yeah. This one is a uh, very, you know, eight bit roguelike hex map sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, yeah, for a quick Insta map, this one is the way to do it. Cause again, you're not going to build a map faster pretty much in any other software no. uh, or at least a hex map in any software compared to this. And this is GM friend at, rhythmmakesthings.com slash gm underscore friend. Now for something with just a little more flash, but still really basic, check out Hextimal or HexTML. This is a very basic hex painter that has the big advantage of allowing you to import your own graphics. This is about as easy to use as GM friend. It's, it's the maps are functional, but not fancy. Again, I think this would be great for generating maps on your, on the fly. So if you spend enough time importing some really good looking hex graph graphics, it could probably make some really impressive looking maps if you're willing to do that extra work. Yeah, this one's sort of the next step up. It's got a, uh, even, even in the basic form without uploading anything, it's got a better set of graphics mm -hmm. available to go through. You can, you're not just doing trees and, and grass and mountains, but you can also get swamps and other things. Yeah. Uh, they're clearly versioning it. They do have a Patreon that, that to support them. And this is available, uh, this is HexTML, HexTML at HexTML.Playtest.Net. Now for something just as quick as easy, but for dungeons and not hex maps, I suggest Dungeon Doodler. The name itself kind of gives you an idea. If you give it the size of your map, how many feet per square, and tell it to go, and then just start doodling like a paint program. There's some nice added bonuses here, like the ability to add hatching in various styles, including your traditional dice and logo style hatching, but you can actually like do outer space and water hatching for different styles of maps. Interestingly, you can't mesh the different types of hatching. So you can have like hatching and water on the same map. Again, it's a really simple tool. For dead simple, the stuff you make here looks pretty good. There's also a stamp tool where you can actually import graphics. So again, if you want to take the time to import a bunch of graphics, you can do things like fill the rooms with beds and barrels and whatever. This one I think is worth checking out and playing around with. It's, it's, it's really simple, but I think there's a lot of power here if you take the time to customize it to your own stuff. 
and this is Dungeon Map Doodler, not Dungeon, not Dungeon Doodler, Dungeon Map Doodler. Oh, sorry. Dot com. Now, sticking with random generators, I have What About? W A T A B O U, What About? Uh, this is a free online site for generating village and city maps. The neat bit here is that it generates everything randomly. It names your town, it names various districts, as well as giving you the top down map. You can also change all that. You can click on it, you can change the names, and you can change the district types. I also dig that it zoomed out a bit. So it's not just the buildings. You also get some farmland and you'll see like a lighthouse off in the distance and stuff like that. I dig this one a lot. It, I like the look of the maps it generates. This is one I could see both using during prep and world building, as well as having to generate that city or village on the fly. And this actually, there's actually a lot more here. If you, if you jump back one level and just go to whataboo or whatabow.h.io, they have the city generator a mansion generator, a one page oh, nice. dungeon generator. And interestingly, they actually have a, uh, uh, and a village generator, sorry. And they have a 3d viewer for oh, their cool. city, for their uh, fantasy city and village generators. So once you've built the 2d layer of your fantasy city or your village, you can pop that into one of their other apps and see the 3d version of that city for a little more uh, fun. And Again, that, I think this one is 100% free. I didn't see any charges. I think they do have a Patreon you can support. Yep, no, absolutely. You're supportable. But uh, that is Whatabow or Whataboo, W-A-T-A-B-O-U dot itch dot I-O. Now, one more random map generation site is Gozzy or Gozzy, G-O-Z-Z-Y dot com. This, again, lets you put in parameters, then generate random things like dungeon maps, city maps, or sorry, cave maps or wilderness maps. There are lots of options here to pick from. But again, this only gives the basic outline. There's no features. There's not even doors presented on these maps. Um, not my strongest recommendation, but really quick. Like if you just really need a, a spot right now and you don't want to draw it yourself, this is a good way to get quick on the fly dungeon, cave and wilderness maps. And just to uh, clarify, it is G-O-Z-Z-Y-S, Gauzyz.com. With uh, the random dungeon map generator, random cave map creator, random wilderness map creator, and uh, some ready-made maps already there to uh, make use of. Oh, again, not fleshed out, no, no room names, just real basic walls. That's yep. about it. <laughs> Now, my last random generator is the fantasy map generator. This thing blew me away. This is for creating an entire setting, an entire world or region. Like, like the, your, your whole game setting could be here, including countries, principalities, municipalities, and so on. When you generate your first map here, you get this very zoomed out view, all color-coded, already named. And you can zoom all the way in and see the rivers, the cities, the roads, the paths. It gets even more impressive when you realize you can click on all these things. And they all have names and lists like culture types and population features and everything. Every town has a unique coat of arms and every country has a coat of arms, all randomly generated. The more I played with this, the more I discovered that was there. And all of these are sliders you can change. So if you want to adjust it so that that's a bigger kingdom, you can do that. And if you want to change it so that these people are despots, you can change that. You can change sections of the map. I, you could spend hours exploring this fantasy world that just showed up in front of you that doesn't exist and no one's ever used before. This is a really impressive tool. Like I honestly think like a lot of people talk about play microscope to, to, to set up your system. Like play microscope, but run this first so that you just get an overview. Here's the land and you like need a city. You can click on a city and get all the details. This thing is impressive. Yeah, I know there's that. This is fantastic. This is the sort of thing where you go to it and you get the same uh, shocking realization as when you go to this is not a person dot com and you see these, um, you know, that this AI has created a person that doesn't actually exist. This yeah. is that, but for maps. Um, there's so much interest there. Like at first you think, oh, look, they made a, they made a pretty map and they threw some names yeah. in it. And then you click on the little button up top and you see, oh, that was just the political map. I want to mm -hmm. see the places of interest or the religions or the height map or just the land map. It's, it's all there. It has yes. generated everything there for you. 
uh, and, and it's just up for you to be able to uh, explore. And it's done it in 2D and 3D. Yep. <laughs> like I said, this one blew me away. It, it's it blew really, me away. really shocking um, what what they've done there. So you that can is even, like filter by shops. Yeah. And it even figured out what shops are in what cities. I was like, oh, my gosh. And that is the fantasy map generator at Asgare, A-Z-G-A-A-R dot github dot io all right sticking with high level overland style maps this is for nate because he wants to make his own he doesn't need no fantasy map generator to give him a fully fleshed out world he should head to map gen 4 this is a paint style so again you're just painting with brushes region map maker for doing overland maps but like region high zoomed out these aren't battle maps we're looking at a level above this one you do have to download to use but everything you make with it is yours to do with as you like, including selling it, streaming it. Now, this one, I didn't have time to actually download and check it out. But I got to say, the sample maps they show, the video for how to use it looks really simple to use and makes rather good looking colorful maps. Way better than anything we had in the 90s. Absolutely. And interestingly, this is an open source project available on GitHub. So if you happen to be a software developer, you can even jump in and help continue nice. the development of map gen 4 from red blob games now jumping back to full map making studios for generating great looking maps i have one of the most impressive ones called dungeon fog now the website is dungeonfog.com but it's spelled the software is spelled dng fog for whatever reason now this is the first piece of software from project deos or Dios, I'm not sure exactly how you're supposed to pronounce that, which is a big deal, right? This is this is supposed to be the next step. This is supposed to be the incarnate killer. This is a planned suite of mapping tools that was funded on Kickstarter and is currently an alpha. And you can check out the full suite if you're a backer, but you had to have been a Kickstarter backer for access to the alpha. So far, the only piece they've released to the public is this dungeon fog, which is for doing battle maps. Again, you're not dungeon level. You're looking at your grids. You're part of a map that I got to say look gorgeous, like really nice looking, professional quality dungeon map. Now, where this beats out some of the other stuff is we are going back to vector-based click and drop graphics. The fact it's vector-based means you get to scroll in and out with any problems. The art assets are fantastic looking. Uh, the sample maps look great. Now, I have to admit, I didn't play around with this one because you had to create an account to be able to sign in to try it. And I just didn't have the time to do that. So I can't tell you how well it actually works but they did a really good job on their videos and selling it. And based on how nice this looks, I am really looking forward to keeping track of Project EOS because if this is step one, wait till they get to their overland maps and their dungeon generators and everything else. Yeah, no, there's a wild range of things there. Uh, there are three levels of accounts uh, of three where you get 12 maps and a bunch of different, you know, all the assets and a bunch of different things and some, some watermarking and things like that. Um, and no credit card required. Then you can upgrade to a premium, which has additional uh, templates and color grading and all sorts of, uh, and unlimited maps. Uh, and then if you are looking to sell, if you are looking for that commercial license, they do have the professional, mm -hmm. but that's the actually the only reason you need to go to that third level. Uh, really, it's just basically two levels for most people, free mm -hmm. and premium. And interestingly, they are partnered with uh, World Anvil uh, yep. and also Kaora and uh, Great GM. So uh, if you are already a World Anvil fan, uh, fan, I'm not sure if there's any financial connection between them. I think there is. But, I think this uh, is World Anvil software. Interesting. What I, I understand. I, as, a, as a paid member of World Anvil, I might have to check this out. There you go. <laughs> so, so World Anvil had this all over their site. Interesting. <laughs> so, and World Anvil has a list of the five best. This is number one. Like. So there, there's there's some ties. Interesting. I, I wonder I wonder if I'm if I will be able to log in uh, with World As a World Anvil. I will, member, that's I will definitely have to check that out. But there that is a dungeonfog.com and the software is DNG or DGN fog. Oh DGN. That makes more sense. My bad. I can't type as usual. Everyone already knows this. So that's it. That's what I've got for suggestions for map making software that I thought looked cool or good or very useful. It ranges from stuff that's going to take you seconds to draw a map to fully detailed tools that professionals use. 
that said, this list is in no way uh, inclusive. Like we we have not, it's it's not even close to extensive. Uh, these were just the ones that looked the best to me with a focus on ones that were free or free to use or at least offered free options that you could upgrade later. For a rather huge list of map making tools, I encourage you and actually anyone who's into dungeon cartography at all or fantasy cartography, go to the Cartographer's Guild. This is an old site. It's been around for a long time and it kind of reminds you what BGG used to look like. But this is the biggest online forum for RPG map makers. There, you can find a thread listing what's probably every piece of map making software out there. Now, I'll be tossing a link to that in the show notes. And Sean, if you could throw that into the chat, I do invite people to check that out. Uh, and just, I just checked, I get 10% off the premium DGN Fog uh, membership with my World Anvil membership. There you go. So there you have our list of map making tools. I hope we were able to find something that works out for you, Nate, and that we help people in general discover some great mapping tools. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bell Hop. Welcome to a quick look at the Folded Space FS Zaya box insert for Zaya Legends of Adrift System and its expansion content. Before we get started, we just want to thank Folded Space for sending us a copy of this insert to build and check out. I also want to point everyone to the FS Zaya box insert build video we put up on YouTube. For this, we took the video of Mo's live stream of building the insert and condensed it down to just under half an hour. Now in that video, you get to see all the various components used to make the box insert, as well as the assembly method I used to finish and finish off with me putting all my Zaya components and the insert back into the box. So you get to see everything once it's all done and ready to go. Now, the other thing I do want to note before I get to the review, I own everything there is for Zaya. I've got the core game, the Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion, the Kickstarter exclusive Cell Sword ship, the Kickstarter missions and titles, the missions and powers expansion, and even the 2000 credit metal coin expansion. Now, the main reason I was interested in this insert and reached out to Folded Space about it was to try to organize all of that in one box. The before and after images from the video are pretty telling. While it sure, sure it fit in the box, it wasn't a pretty sight. I, just for the card stuff, the, the, the top stuff, all of the little bits fit pretty good. So back in the first year that Tabletop Bellhop was a thing, I wrote an article and we had a podcast where we talked about box inserts and if they're worth it. Back then, we noted there were two main things that we look for in a box insert. Now, first off, the insert should provide improved storage. Well, the FS Zaya insert didn't let me get rid of any boxes since everything I already owned fit in the box, but only by throwing out the original plastic insert that was in the base game, it did really help organize all the components for the game. Before building this insert, I had everything sorted into baggies. So many baggies. While this worked, it wasn't great. If things shifted and things slid around and the tiles got messed up and trying to find the right baggie usually just meant taking the box and turning it upside down onto the table and having all the players help me sort through everything. Now this foam core box insert gave me a place for everything. Added to that, the trays in this insert all fit snugly enough that things shouldn't shift or move around much. That said, there aren't any lids on anything. So I'm not sure I'd want to take my chances with storing this game any way but flat. And when transporting it, I'm going to try to keep it flat as well. Though, while caution is wise, I do suspect it wouldn't end up that bad if it had to travel tipped on its side as long as the box lid was kept closed. It's if that box lid starts lifting while horizontal that you'd be mm. in trouble. Yeah, stacking it without something to hold that shut, if it starts to slide at all, you could have quite the mess. Now, the second thing I think an insert should do is make setup and tear down easier. This is where this Zaya box insert really shines. I love the way it's made to not only store the components in a logical manner between trays, but many of the trays are also designed so that they work as component organization while you play out on the table. You just take them out of the box and put them on the table and go. Now, a big part of what I dig about this is the ship upgrades in particular, the way they are sorted. They are sorted by color and type into trays that you can pass around between players. 
It's these kind of design choices that actually enhance gameplay and make it better than the base game and make things flow more smoothly when actually playing. You know, this is a huge feature that I honestly demand of in an insert. If you can't use the pieces in the box and on the table, you're really reducing the value of the assistance it offers. Fair. Now, as for building the box insert, it went very smoothly. Uh, most of the trays were pretty basic boxes and very easy to build. But even the fiddlier upgrade trays, the, they were the weirdest, I had the strangest pieces, really weren't that complex. Now, for this build, I did use Folded Space's new and much improved assembly method, which includes uh, a dry build and then a trick for laying down the tiles or the pieces in a very specific way so that you can lay down all the glue at once. Now, you can find out more about this method at foldedspace.net slash assembly. There are lots of videos to walk you through it. And I got to say, I really did appreciate this new method. The, the dry build, flatten everything, apply the glue in a grid, tab to tab, then reassemble. Now, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but this is the method that let me build a nine board tray in under an hour. Now, looking back to my previous Folded Space builds, I uh, did a live stream for that as well, and you can find it on YouTube. I did an eminent domain, the FSM DOM build, where I didn't know this method. And it took me almost an hour to build a three sheet insert for that for a much smaller game. And the main time waster was applying the glue and how I was doing it on each individual piece one at a time before assembly. And we should note that while for this particular build, quick dry glue wasn't used, no. I think it's really recommended in the future for other builds. Otherwise, you might want to let things sit at least overnight before using your new insert just to be sure you don't get any glue on cards or components. Yeah, for most people, I don't think it'd matter as much, but I was trying to live stream it, and I ended up basically trying to kill half an hour in the middle of the stream to let the glue dry enough so that I could actually put things back in. So I, they, they do recommend quick drying wood glue, though. And actually, it's something I probably should mention to build this insert. You do need your standard PVA white glue or wood glue. Overall, I was really impressed by this board game box insert. It was a pleasure to build. It was way quicker to build than expected, and it does the two things I want an insert to do. It did a great job of organizing the components, including all of the expansion, add-ons, and Kickstarter exclusives. And it also made setup and takedown quicker and goes beyond that. For me, the step above by offering trays that are not only functional for storage, but are also functional during play. It is so nice to be able to just go, hey, you want to look at the lasers? Here's the tray of lasers. Now, is this an insert you'd recommend for people who don't have everything the way you do? Is it just as valuable for someone who has maybe only the base game or the base game plus one expansion? I think it is. I, I definitely, again, the organization for the Starship components being the big, biggest advantage you have here, being able, again, being able to pass those. Hey, let me look at the engines. Hey, let, let me look at the shields and be able to just take that tray and look at the tiles, which already have all the information you Excuse me. Look at the tiles because they already have all the information you need on them. Also, there's a place to put all of the different resource cubes, which again can just be put out on the, onto the board. There's a nice spot to keep the damage counters. There's even a spot to put all the stands for the miniatures. The thing is, the original Zaya does have a box insert. It's a very cheap, flimsy plastic insert. And while it does have a space for everything, everything's not separated out. You're still going to have to tie, like, there's no spot to put the different colors of resource cubes. Instead, you just got a tray to put the components. And again, with the, the various upgrades, yeah, there's a tray to put them on, but even keeping the game flat, they fell out all the time. It just wasn't enough. I honestly think it's probably worth picking up as long as you play the game often enough, which is the case for most of these. If you're playing Zaya once a, a once every year, you probably don't need an insert. You're just going to spend the extra time sorting things. But if you're playing it regularly, they said this does actually make setup take down quicker. So you're going to get the game to the table. You're not going to be sitting there going, oh, man, yeah, I want to play Zaya, but we'd have to sort through everything. That's gone with this. Now, while there are other inserts out there for Zaya from a variety of different companies, and I admit, most of these do the same things, right? They, they feature a way to, especially the upgrades. Everyone seems to have figured out you want individual trays for each upgrade type. The thing is, wooden trays are not light and they are not as easy to build. 
this was such a rapid build and the foam core weighs almost nothing. Like I, I should, probably should have weighed the package somehow, but you'd need like a kitchen scale to weigh this. I can't just throw it on my standard scale to figure out how light it is. I don't want to think like, this is not a light game. There's a lot of cardboard, there's pre-painted miniatures and metal coins. My copy as I is not something I'd want to carry for a couple blocks. I can't imagine how bad it would be if there was a wooden insert in there. And if you don't want to lift the game, are you going to pick something else to play? <laughs> totally fair. I gotta say, if you have a copy of Zaya Legend of the Drift System, especially if you've also got Embers of a Forsaken Star, I strongly recommend picking up this insert. And we do, at the Tabletop Bellhop, always recommend Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion for yes. anyone who owns Zaya Legends of a Drift. Yes. Now that's it for our look at the FS Zaya box insert from Folded Space for Zaya Legends of a Drift System and all of its current expansions. When you've got time, be sure to check out the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com to watch the insert build and check out the written version of this review. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So not a bad week, uh, gaming-wise at all for me. Uh, two more games off the pile of shame. With the pile of obligation nearing its bottom, I've been trying to work on my own personal pile of shame before we start flooding the uh, Casa de Bellhop with new games. Um, we wrapped up Shy Pluto finally, and I got Villainous back to the table, uh, much to my oldest daughter's delight. So I'm going to start off with the Shy Pluto expansion for Space Base. Again, no spoilers. Don't worry, tech. Uh, Friday, Tori and Kat were over. We broke out Space Base with Shy Pluto and moved on to the final mission. Now, what I didn't realize is this is a final mission that isn't really even a mission. It just kind of sets up everything so that all your games of Space Base going forward use the new rules presented here. It does add a bunch of new cards to the game and it does add stuff. But at this point, you're done. Pluto, there, there's no more story to read. You've gotten, you you finished the campaign. There's no more story to, di to discover. There's no more things you're going to unlock. Or is it? Because there is a teaser for part two, which we basically knew was coming because the box says Saga Expansion 1. And why would they put Saga Expansion 1 if there wasn't going to be a Saga Expansion 2? Fair enough. So it's, uh, it's interesting that it's finally done. I, I have to say I'm a little disappointed that now that it's done, it's just there. I I, yeah. I feel like I would like I would like to to sort of take that that journey with you, but uh, instead now when we play uh, there, it, Shy Pluto will just be part of it, and I'll have to figure it out. I guess. Uh, yeah, in a way, uh, like overall, we love playing through it. Like you you deserve to play through it, which we probably could because this isn't a, a legacy game in the fact that I didn't have to write on anything. There's no stickers. There were no markers. So I could technically roll everything back and all the cards are numbered. So I just have to find them all and then put them in numbered order again. It's possible to roll it back. Um, and, and I that journey was a lot of fun. But the final changes to the base game, the, the end result just didn't really excite us that much. Now, at this point, we've only played, well, I guess two games because we finished Shy Pluto and then we played one game after. Although, really, both of those use the same components because, like I said, the, the last mission basically sets things up for going forward. So we're playing now the complete version. Um, because I've only played two, this isn't a full review. This is we talked about doing a review of this night, and I honestly want to play it a couple more times. I want to at least two more times with all the stuff from Pluto unlocked. Now the problem is what Sean mentioned. Now that I've finished I Pluto, you're expected to use all this stuff going forward. This isn't like an optional expansion or a module you can easily turn on or off. You either have to use it all or not use it at all which means going through decks, multiple decks of cards and removing lots of them because there were a significant number of cards added to the, with this expansion. Like I was really hoping there was going to be some quick way to turn it on and off. Like, like here's a new board that's on the table. You can play without it. The problem is a lot of these new cards are specific to new mechanics. Again, trying to keep everything high level and spoiler free. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's interesting. So that's, it's, I guess you have to like it or not. Um, and then I guess if you don't like it, the option is, you know, to wait and sort out. of pull it all out and see if expansion two might make things different. So you might want to throw it back in in order to play through <laughs> expansion two. And then when you get to the end of that, decide again whether or not you're going to leave yeah. it in or 
or take it out. But uh, at that point, you're sort of getting into some some pricey stuff you're not actually going to use. Yeah. Now, I will say, almost everyone out there I see says the game's incomplete with Ochai Pluto. So, so maybe we're the outliers. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I just need to play with five players. I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe we can get it up in, in Tabletop Simulator and we can play through it using all of Shy Pluto now that I've discovered it all. So I, we'll see. I, I could just be us. But again, we don't love all the popular stuff all the time. The reason I'm giving, getting rid of my copy of Watergate, right? Yeah, <laughs> we'll no, love that be, one too. We'll definitely, we'll definitely throw it up in, in uh, Simulator. We do love that, uh, that version, that the digital version on Tabletop Simulator. So, and it does have all the Shy Pluto co- yep. components. So we'll definitely have to give it a try. All right. The next game we played with Tori and Kat on Friday was my production copy of Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria. The, I, 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 I think I want to call it the retail version, but I'm slightly concerned because I got it from Kickstarter. There might be something in there that's not in the retail version. But it was very much wrapped and sold like a retail version, so I'm not positive. So I'm going to say production copy until I know otherwise. Now, I talked about this before. I couldn't tell you which podcast episode because I didn't look it up. But we did preview this game, a prototype copy of this game, which I actually played at all player counts, including solo. But this is my first time playing the production copy. This is the hot off the Kickstarter presses version. Now, I got to say, I really liked the prototype and I pushed the Kickstarter to everyone I could because it seemed really cool. And I got to say, those feelings haven't changed with the production version because the game hasn't really changed. Uh, except for component quality. The components are actually really impressive and they're really nice, but like even the dice haven't changed. The sides on the dice, the, the, the gameplay is identical to what I played. And the rule book didn't even change. Like if it said page six, the page six I have printed out on a sheet of paper is the same as the now glossy page six that's in the rule book, including even all the examples. So like the, there, was, there was no change and that's not bad. It just meant that the this was a fully tested, play-tested designed and developed prototype which i gotta admit i'm appreciating a lot after some recent prototypes we've tried yeah it's 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 nice when you don't have to spend part or a large part of your time spent that should be spent reviewing Mm -hmm. communicating with designers and production companies to figure out how you're supposed to be reviewing the game yeah totally agree um, the only thing that I was really hoping they changed, they didn't. I was really hoping they'd do something about making the races asymmetric. It just, it should be there. It's like, and I even gave them my own version where I'm like, this is what I would give the six different races in this game. This race would do this. This race would do this. This race, but uh, unfortunately they didn't put any in there. So now as for the game itself, uh, for those of you who didn't listen to us back then or forget what I said, uh, this is Shadow Kings of Valeria. So it's in the Valeria world. But it's not a card game. It, it's something different. This is a dice-driven worker placement game that has you place a worker, then take a die. You're playing the baddies in the Valeria universe. It is quite the diversion from the other Valeria games, but well worth checking out. Pat, in particular, was really impressed by just how, I, I like the term tight, how, how balanced and tight and just everything made sense and worked the way you expect it to. The iconography is great, though it's a bit overwhelming when you first start. But often it's like once you start playing and you know the different things, it's like, oh, and there's the reminder right there to remind me of that. And, oh, there's the thing telling me that that's how this works. And oh, now that makes sense once I played. By the time we were done, both Tori and Kat were like, okay, where do we get a copy of this? And they had their phones out looking to see where they can get copies. And no, they didn't play the prototype. This was their first experience with the game that sold them after just one play. So it seems like you did a great job there, uh, Daily Magic Games. Now, personally, I'm looking forward to playing it some more. Um, I don't feel I need to play a ton of games with the base game, but by kickstarting it, I also got the expansion. Now, this will be totally new to me. I have not gotten to play any of the expansion content. Those were all stretch goals that were all met during the Kickstarter. And so I am really looking forward to trying out the expansion stuff. I'll probably do up a full review of the expansion content because... It was obvious they're going to be able to sell it in stores because it came with a in a shrink wrapped box inside my box, which I thought was pretty neat. Check out my unboxing video to see that. Um, what I'm not sure is, am I going to review Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria? I'm, I'm not sure. I had to talk to Deanna about that SEO reasons and stuff like that. There's no obligation to do so. Now this is just be my own choice. I kind of want people to know about this game. 
but I don't really have a lot to say that's new. Like, I just kind of feel like we'll be duplicating the, the prototype review. Yeah, it's almost like, I mean, we should definitely, I think, probably review the expansion because that is, again, yeah, new content. New. But, uh, you know, if if it really hasn't changed much, uh, there's only so much you can say without just rehashing what you're saying without saying this is a prototype, it may change. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, other than, other than taking out all the, the couching of terms, uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and that was one of our first prototypes. So I don't even know if I did a good job of pointing out it was a prototype preview as much as I, I am now much more clear about. All right, next up, uh, Tori Cat went home. The, the, the games we play, I have the three games of Space Base and Valeria took longer than I thought. I, I was surprised by that. Though they did show up late because Tori got stuck at the border and whatever. Um, and we got Panzos. They finally got to try Windsor Pizza Panzos they were pretty happy they've never tried panzo with your end like how long have you guys been playing with them? they live in amosburg that's the biggest problem we don't usually eat dinner with them before playing that's Uh, that's that's a new thing post covid because we don't get to hang out is we do we never used to everyone used to come over at 8 30 after they've eaten so so the next thing we did is we went over to deanna's mother's house and played games with the entire family um, I specifically picked out six player games for this event and I brought Disney Villainous. Um, we played it with all the characters, all villains with uh, the kids, Deanna and I and Deanna's mom and sister. Now I've enjoyed Villainous. I haven't played it a lot. I know it's an older game. It's a, we're, we're all about the new hotness, right? Like I, I think I've now played it three times. So I, I don't have a lot of experience with this game. It is one of my oldest daughter's favorite games. She's actually played it more often than me. And I got to say right now, do not play villainous with six players like it was just it was too long with way too much downtime waiting for five other players to go but more importantly it was a brain burner like it was mentally challenging trying to keep track of what five other people are doing at the same time made worse by the fact that this is one of the most asymmetric games on the market not only is everyone's card decks you have two their two decks are unique The way you win the game for every single person is different from everyone else. And there's just trying to watch who's close to winning. Oh, she might win this turn. Oh, you're almost going to wait. Wait, you're going to win. Has anyone attacked her yet? Like, while it's really cool and easy to track with, say, three players, even the adults found it hard with six. Now, that said, this was my first time seeing all of the core villains at the table at once, a couple I'd never seen before. So, this was a great way to see all of the different characters and to see like how Jafar plays compared to how Ursula plays. And it really highlighted the asymmetry. Like, like literally every person had something completely different. They were working towards. I learned a lot about each of them and I look forward to playing again and getting to see Jafar and the queen at the table again and getting to use what I learned during this game. Just not with all of it at once. No, no more six people at once. Interestingly, uh, board game geek. If you look at the, uh, recommended player count uh 83.6 percent of people recommend not playing it at yeah. six players uh it's so so they recommend it's a two to six player but best is three is, yeah. is pretty and then and that's a pretty solid recommendation i know a lot of times those community recommendations are are pretty wishy-washy and could go anyway uh, that that recommendation for best at three is a pretty solid yeah. number so i was thinking three or four I played three before. I haven't tried four. I was thinking three or four, but three could very well be the sweet spot. And I will also know all I own is the base game. There are three, four, maybe five expansions for this game, it's each of which comes right with three more characters. It's also possible that the beginner box characters aren't great at six, but it sounds like based on BGG that in general, you probably shouldn't play the game with six. And I've got to agree. Finally, last game of the last week is a pile of shame game that I've been looking forward to trying, and that is Viscounts of the West Kingdom from Renegade Games off my pile of shame. Now, I picked this up from a local gamer who was purging her collection, and I've been looking forward to trying it because I love Raiders of the North Sea. This is actually the second game in the series of games. They're all designed by Shem Phillips, all published by uh, Renegade that are all something of the something. There's like Paladins and whatever. Um, This is the second one I got to try, and it completely threw me for a loop. It was not at all what I expected. 
Now, the problem was, I was thinking it's going to be like Raiders, right? And and Raiders, I don't get the BGG rating on Raiders, to be honest. Raiders, to me, is a very light game. Great for hooking new gamers. It's quick and easy to teach. I'd almost say a gateway game. The only reason I wouldn't put it as a gateway game is I think you need someone who knows the game to teach it. Like, you need a gamer to teach other people how to play. But as long as you've got someone who knows the game well and games in general to teach it, I think anyone plays. Both my kids have played Raiders, and they like it. Viscounts is nothing like this. This is meaty, like like heavy. It, it has a Board Game Geek rating weight of 3.44, and that was totally not what I was expecting. Raiders is a 2.53, which to me seems high. I, I would not call Raiders in the North Sea more complicated than Race for the Galaxy in any way, shape, or form. Unless Race for the Galaxy is now moved, but that used to be 2.50. That's always been my medium weight marker. I don't see how Raiders... All I can think of is that people are rating Raiders based on Raiders with the expansions. Because yes, the expansions do up that weight and complexity. Base game those dead simple. Place a worker, take a worker, do a thing. Collect Vikings to go raid places to get loot. Like, it, it's not a hard game. Vikings, ooh, it, 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 it's, it's big. Interesting. Uh, so, also, just a weird, weird little note, just stepping back one sec to Villainous before we get too deep into uh, mm -hmm. Viscounts. Um, oddly enough, the Disney Villainous expansions aren't expansions because yes, they are standalone. all standalone. So you can't go to Disney Villainous, click on expansions and see anything. According to oh. that, there are no expansions, <laughs> uh, but there are four expandalone four? Uh, yeah. games. Uh, Wicked to the Core, Evil Comes Prepared, Perfectly Wretched, and Despicable Plots. Yeah, I thought there might have been five now. Maybe they've been... That. Is the Gaston one there? Because that was uh, the latest one. Uh, that is the... It's got Gaston one. flexing on the cover. That is the, the, the latest one. So yeah, it's still only Okay, four. so that one was out. I wasn't sure if that was still coming. Or it's a, yeah, it's you can buy them. One. Maybe they realize three players perfect because all their expand loans are exactly three players. Could be. Interesting. I, I am not at the point of buying uh, expansions for that. And so far, my daughter's not begging for them. So I don't know if we'll ever go on to that one. All right. So jumping back to Viscounts. All right. The problem here isn't Viscounts. It's me, right? I, I'll admit, I knew nothing about this game before grabbing it to play on Sunday. Other than the fact it was from Shem Phillips and it's published by Renegade and it's it's from the same person who did Raiders of the North Sea. I had no clue. I was about to sit down and play a deck builder. Like it, it's a deck builder. It's not even it and, and it's got a unique thing going where you're putting cards into play on a in, on a sliding scale where they stay in play for th three turns and then sometimes do stuff when they fall off and there's ways to cycle your decks and stuff. I had no clue it was a point salad. Like, like this is Stefan Feld level of point salad. Like you're building buildings and you get points and you're collecting deeds, which are worth points. And you're collecting debts, which are worth points. If you pay them off, you're putting worker meeples up on this like plastic tower in the middle of the board. And you get points for being what level of the tower you're on. And if people bump you off, you can get points. And then there's a Rondell based movement system where you move your buy count clockwise around the board. And like all of that was a surprise to me. I was totally expecting a worker placement game with some cards, not a card game with a little tiny bit of worker placement. Yeah, it's a, it was it was nominated Golden Geek Heavy Game of the Year. Yeah, for see, twenty twenty. I, I said, <laughs> I'm like, I had no clue. Now I do have a serious complaint that could have potentially been an issue on Sunday. I mentioned this at the top here. When I was picking games for game nights, I wanted games all six of us could play, including the kids. Now, yes, I was also expecting this to be around the complexity level of Raiders that they'd be able to get. I personally not sure about introducing this to the kids yet, not until I've at least mastered it. And it may be too much for the youngest at this point, totally. Now, the biggest problem, though, is that the game only plays four players. That's despite the box very clearly stating it is a one to six player game. Thankfully, we didn't start the game until after dinner. And at that point, the kids were more interested in jumping on tech and before heading home rather than playing a game. So I didn't have six people willing to play. But I actually like like I did my unboxing video, but I punched everything at the table and was like, wait a minute, there's only four colors here and there's only four player boards. And then I flipped the box over and it says one to six players. Like, what is going on here? So that's an issue. This is not a five or six player game. I Googled it. It's not a five to six player game with the expansions. 
It is a misprint on the box for the Renegade edition of the game. Mm. So don't expect a six-player game. Now, I will admit, with the Wii, I don't think I would have wanted it to be a six-player game either. But that's being said, I honestly grabbed this game because I looked for six-player games. So, yeah, uh, sorry there. Now, as for the game, it was a bit of a mess. Uh, it went way longer than expected because I didn't know what we were getting into. Uh, we probably should have started an hour earlier. We did have fun, but it was an exploration game. It was very much a just-take-a-thing. Uh, it was one of those games where you're going to put out a bunch of resources and a bunch of characters and you're going to draft which ones you want to start with. And you're like, I don't know what I need these for. So it was very much a just do stuff. Um, we did have fun. The big thing it did do, though, was want, make us want to play again. Like, like now that I know what this is, now that I know what's a deck builder, now that I know what scores point, now that I've seen on game and game scoring, I'll know what characters I might want to start or what hero I want my deck. Deanna actually asked to play this as soon as we got home that night. And I was just kind of burnt out. I'm like, no, no, let's just watch Netflix and chill. We'll, we'll watch some Star Trek Voyager or something. And at this point, we haven't gotten it back to the table. But I am really looking forward to really deep diving this game now that I know what to expect. Like when you're expecting a light worker placement game that I expect my youngest daughter to be able to play. And here you have a 2020 heavy game of the year. It comes as a bit of a shock. And while that player count thing is not cool. Yeah, and it's amusing because I'm looking at the back of the box now and there's, there's people laughing about it on, on the Board Game Geek picture featuring the Renegade Games, the 1-6 to six version, when, yes. when literally the component list is very clearly, there's yes. only going to be four players here. But Every I didn't look at that. Four, 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 four. Yep. But the game does say 1-6 to six players. Yeah, I grabbed the back of the box and I look, you know, you know what to look for, right? Yeah. You're looking for like a person's head and a number and I'm like, person's head, 1-6. to six. All right, perfect. This will be great. I, I like literally was looking at the pile of shame going, I need six player games. Yeah. What the heck plays six players? And I literally was like, started at the top of the pile and I was like, no, no. Oh, there we go. So uh, for me, I, I, I haven't gotten any board games yet. We did some kitchen renovation redesign mm -hmm. stuff around the house. And so the table that I would play board games on has been completely covered with things that need to get reassigned. So that hasn't gotten to the table yet. But what I did do is we finally started officially uh, the um, Amazing Heroes game. Uh, and I got to say, it's been it's been fun, but interesting because I've, I've got eight players uh, doing a play by post superhero game. And it's uh, it's definitely some management. I'm using as many different tools as I can. I've got hidden channels that they can't see that I'm leaving notes in. <laughs> I've got a notebook next to me that I can keep scribbles in uh as well as the character keeper that we're using um and it's uh you know again we're because we're doing play by post there are certain people who are more active and and mm -hmm. you know, available at different times some people you know work all day and only really have a couple of hours at the end of the day to to jump in and post and so i'm, I'm learning a whole lot about the sort of the management of a game like a superhero game mm -hmm. uh in order to keep everybody active but not lose people because you know they want to be more active and so it, the managing of, uh, of of time and and space within the action has been an interesting yeah. experience and uh you know there are things that i'm going to do differently once we get past this first um you know first set of villains that they're fighting against uh yeah. to try and help even more but uh i think it's been working well and i've gotten some good feedback from uh, the players so far so that's been fun sounds good now that's one you're running on Discord, right? That's right. It's Discord. Yeah. We have an entire server dedicated to it with a, a lot of channels in order to try nice. and make things balanced. Like each player has their own channel that they can throw character images, character okay. discussions in. Uh, plus we have multiple RPG channels, out of char character channels, an entire section just for safety. Nice. So, well, how about a look good. ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, someone's coming down to Windsor this weekend. And, well, the main goal for that trip is for us to get through the entire Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion, which there's 12 modules. So hopefully we just play 12 times. But I don't know how these are set up. <laughs> like, if there's a you have to win, it may take longer than that. So we'll see how that goes. 
Um, uh, the tech in the chat is saying Sean Con too, not quite because no, of this. this. Is, so, this is really just Draconis Con. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Draconis Con. There you go. Now, if we do have time, it would be cool if we could knock off some of the games on the Sean Must playlist. Um, which I've recently added the Red Burnus and Viscounts of the West Kingdoms too, because they're both deck builders doing something very different. So it would be cool if we can get something else played. We'll see. Uh, Tori and Cat will be joining us. I don't know what time you're coming into town and that, but we may start playing without them and they'll join in for a bit or whatever. We'll see. But we can talk about that in the after show. Now, the other thing, I, don't, I shouldn't even mention it because every time I mention it, it doesn't happen. So maybe you should just stop here and I won't say it. But I do still have two more folded space box inserts to build and a game to unbox, which I actually wanted to unbox before you came down because you wanted to play it. And it's a pile of obligations, so it might it might surpass and bump the uh, Sean playlist just so we can get in at least one place so Sean can talk intelligently when we review roll camera, or at the yeah. very least get it unboxed so I can read the manual at least. You know, read the yeah. read the instructions and get an idea go. of what it is. Um, it the most re the reason I want to play that one is because it reminds me of one of my favorite old roll and move monopoly style board games which was about making movies and, yeah. and the the memories that game in, has invoked just seeing the box um give me some interest in that but problem is i got one day to get that done before you get here so <laughs> yeah, well. we'll see i could just not do an unboxing and well crack you, it open there are and... there are also you know you can over the one version to open and one version to unbox but Oh, I could do that, but I don't want to do That's that because I don't want to send a, a sealed. We, we hint, hint. We may be doing a giveaway after we review it, or or to coincide with when our review launches, most likely. There you go. All right, moving on. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Cat and Tori, it's been awesome getting to game with you two again, and I hope we don't have to lock back down and that has to go on hold, but it's starting to look inevitable. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, so I need you and Math Guy Dave, who's on this list later. I wasn't going to call him out tonight, but I'll call him out now. Just keep pushing me to run an online game for patrons, and you may eventually get your wish. Just don't let me forget about it. I don't want to promise anything yet, but if you keep pushing, the, the, the odds it'll happen may keep going up. Sean P. Kelly of the excellent Gaming and BS podcast. It was good to catch the show again this week. Yeah, I caught it while. too. That was nice. Yeah, it had been a while since I've seen them live. And then finally, tonight, we would like to thank Andrew Dacey. Thanks, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media. There's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com and find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice. Sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we are providing and would like to support Sean and me and Deanna's continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show, where there's an unbox, uh, un unpackaging, packaging, and yeah. stop by Sundays for brunch, where we may continue talking about some of the new product coming out for Gen Con this week. For we Tabletop Bellhop on. Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean, and I'm Mo. Thank you, and, and game, game on. on.